graduate degree, graduating magna cum laude from LSU in Baton Rouge in 2002, and his medical degree from, from the LSU School of Medicine in New Orleans in 2007. He completed a urology residency at LSU Health Sciences Center in Shreveport and a fellowship in robotics <coughs> and laparoscopic surgery at the Urology San Antonio in Texas. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Paul Walker. All right, thanks. All right, thank you. As he said, I'm Paul Walker. I'm a urologist at Louisiana Urology. I appreciate everybody coming out to hear me talk. It's hard to follow up Rudy Macklin because he's a local legend here, but I'll do my best. Um, I knew Rudy Macklin was speaking today, and so a lot of you probably do know him or have heard his name, but I wasn't, I knew who he was, but I didn't realize all the accomplishments, especially in college. He's got quite a, uh, quite a successful career. I just wanted to highlight a few before I get started. He is the second all-time leading scorer in LSU men's basketball history behind Pistol Pete Maravich, so that's pretty good company. He is actually currently the all-time leading rebounder at LSU, so he has more rebounds than Shaquille O'Neal. He is the uh, NCAA First Team All-American in 1980 and 1981, and he was the SEC Player of the Year in 1981. And you can see behind him there uh, that there's four jerseys retired in the PMAC, and he is one of those along with Pistol Pete, Shaquille O'Neal, and Bob Pettit. So Rudy Macklin's a good company. All right, so my talk is going to be divided into two parts, uh, prostate issues, there's a lot of different issues. The two main things that a urologist is going to see in their office is benign prostatic hyperplasia, which we shorten to BPH, which is essentially having an enlarged prostate. And then prostate cancer will be the second part of my talk. <clears throat> I just want to show part of this little video clip. Anyone that's ever gone to the urologist, been sitting in the waiting room, and is about to have their pr first prostate exam could probably identify with this video. Hi. It's Manolo Santanos, and I'm in the waiting room at St. Joseph's Hospital. Today I'm going to see Dr. Matsumoto. He's, uh, he's going to check my prostate. I'm not looking forward to it because it's my it's back there. All right, let's see what happens. I'm really not looking forward to this. I can't believe I'm in a hospital. And what if they find something? What if they find something? Then what? I can't believe I'm doing this. I don't even know what prostate it is. I don't even know where it is. I don't even know if it hurts. What if it hurts? He does this and he goes, oh my God. How did you talk me into this? I have no idea how I'm in this situation right now. Is it too late to, can we not do this? Can we just, I go all my life without having another person's fingers in my butt. Fine, we'll do it, fine. This is Dr. Matsumoto. What do you do, Dr. Matsumoto? I'm a urologist. What exactly does a urologist do? The easiest way to put it is we're plumbers. So we look after the plumbing. So we look after the kidneys, the ureters, which are the tubes that drain the kidney, the bladder, the prostate. Where's the prostate exactly? Because I'm not even sure. The prostate um, is a walnut-shaped organ that's found between the bladder and the penis. The prostate examination is done through the rectum because it's immediately adjacent or right beside the rectum. So that's just right inside the anus. You can actually feel the prostate right there. How many fingers do you use? This, this is the one that goes It's only down. one? It's only one. This is for a second opinion. <laughs> so who should be getting a prostate exam? Men over the age of 50 okay, uh, with at least a 10-year life expectancy uh, should discuss getting a PSA and a digital rectal examination with their family doctor. Uh, and that should be done on a yearly basis. Oh my God, every year? That's what's recommended, yes. All right, we don't have to watch the whole video, but <clears throat> I thought it was pretty funny and educational. So as the urologist said, the prostate does sit um, right here. This is the prostate. It sits right below the bladder and right above the base of the penis there. And, and there's the urinary sphincter, and there's the rectum right next to the prostate. So when you urinate, the urine will, the bladder will contract, the urine will flow through the prostate, through the urethra and the penis, and on out the body. A lot of people ask me, well, what does the prostate do? It secretes seminal fluid 
Um, when you ejaculate, that nourishes sperm, so it's got nutrients in it in the fluid. All right, so the first part of the talk, again, is just BPH having a big prostate. On the left here is a schematic diagram of basically what a normal sized prostate would look like. You got a nice open urethra, easy to urinate. But as the prostate, as men age, the prostate tends to enlarge in a lot of guys and you can get this situation where you've got a small narrowed urethra. You can see also the bladder is a lot thicker and what happens is the bladder has to work extra hard, the bladder wall will thicken um, which will lead to an actual decreased bladder capacity and a less efficient bladder. A thick wall bladder is a less efficient bladder. <clears throat> so BPH, it is a pathologic process that can lead to urinary symptoms in the aging male. It is characterized by an increase in the number of cells. It's not the cells that are actually bigger, but there's more cells and they surround that uh, periurethral area around the prostate. The exact molecular mechanism of this process is unknown, um, but only age and having testicles are positively correlated with the development of enlarged prostate. So again, the, as, as men age, the prostate can enlarge and this can lead to urinary symptoms. The two mechanisms by this way this happens is the actual size of the prostate and also you have an increase in these receptors called alpha-1 receptors, these little receptors in the prostate and the bladder neck area. And alpha-1 receptors, when they're stimulated, they cause an increased tone and actual a contraction, which narrows the urethra and makes it harder to urinate. All right, so if this is what your experience is like in the restroom, you probably ought to come see me. All right, <clears throat> so some of the symptoms that guys with having a big prostate have, not everybody has all of these. You may have one or two, or you may have them all, is a difficulty starting your stream, so it takes you a long time to get going, a weak urinary stream, uh, your stream stops and starts instead of nice continuous flow. You may have a lot of dribbling at the end, and, then, and also a feeling of not emptying, and after about 15 minutes, you gotta go right back and do it again. Also, as the bladder has to overwork, you can lead an overactive bladder, and that can lead to symptoms of urgency, which is a sudden desire to urinate that's hard to defer, frequency, which is urinating too often during the day, and nocturia, which is getting up at night and interrupted sleep to go urinate. Uh, having a big prostate can also cause blood in the urine. If it's severe and been going on for a long time, the bladder having to work so hard may actually decompensate and lead to ineffective bladder contractions which could lead to retention where you can't pee. Um, also hydronephrosis can develop which is pretty rare and can lead to kidney damage. So this is an example of what hydronephrosis looks like. Hydronephrosis is basically the urine backs up in the system so here's the bladder, here's the prostate, and here are the kidneys. And you can see here, urine builds up because the bladder is not efficiently emptying. That can lead to thinning of the kidneys and it can lead to damage of the kidneys over time. Uh, however, uh, having a big prostate is not a risk factor for prostate cancer. A lot of people think, well, if I'm having urinary symptoms of big prostate, does that mean I have prostate cancer? Not necessarily. All right. <clears throat> The blood in the urine? Did somebody ask me a question? Yeah, blood in the urine is from uh, multiple different things. Actually, the most common reason a man would get blood in his urine is from the prostate, believe it or not. Um, but there are other things that can do it. Having an infection can do it. Um, being severely dehydrated can do it. Uh, but also bladder and kidney cancer are too. So if someone has blood in their urine and they come see me, we have to kind of do more tests to see, you know, before just blaming it on the prostate, we have to rule out some other stuff. Just trace. just trace blood? Yeah, if it's just trace blood, sometimes we'll repeat it, and if it's persistently there, uh, then we may do some further testing to look into that. You're welcome. All right, so the dreaded prostate exam. Uh, I haven't found a man yet that came in excited about this. Um, you can see here in the back the physician saying everything's okay. The uh, patient does not seem to be enjoying it though. <laughs>
All right, so this is, the, you know, we're not just trying to torture patients. There's actually a reason for this exam. You can see here what happens is the physician puts his finger in the rectum, and the rectum, it does sit right next to the prostate. And actually, most prostate cancers that you can feel do uh, show up on the back side of the prostate. So you can see there that you can actually feel the prostate. What the physician is feeling for is not only the size to assess how big your prostate is, but also the consistency and is trying to feel if there's any firm, suspicious nodules that'd be worrisome for prostate cancer. All right, so I hope that nobody that uh, goes to see their urologist to get an exam has this experience for their first time. Okay, heart sounds good. All right, Mr. Griffin, I'm just going to need you to drop your pants and we'll check your prostate. Uh, what? Drop your pants, turn around, and lean forward. Uh, okay. So how's this work? You just feel my pulse, so... Ah! 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 <laughs> <laughs> what the hell was that? Mr. Griffin, that's a prostate exam. Shut up! You had your finger in my ass! That's how a prostate exam is performed. Now, if you'll just let me... Get away from me! Ugh, <laughs> 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 get a tan. <laughs> All right, just... Wanted to lighten the mood a little bit. Um, all right, so when you go see the urologist about your prostate issue, an initial evaluation will be done. So they'll ask you, the urologist will ask you a series of questions, try to get a sense of what symptoms you're having, how severe your symptoms are, and how bothered you are by your symptoms. A prostate exam, which is also called a digital rectal exam, will likely be performed. A urinalysis will you urinate in a, a specimen cup. A post void residual may be done, and that's done usually by the nurse. Well, they'll, after you urinate, they'll measure your bladder to see if you're emptying your bladder, see if you're retaining any, any urine. And also a PSA, which is a prostate-specific antigen, that's a blood test, may also be performed, and I'll talk about that more in my prostate cancer talk. All right, so the urologist will, or the, any physician that you see, your primary care doctor will look over, see what medications you're taking to see if maybe any of the medicines you're on could be contributing. Two common culprits that can cause some urinary problems would be a decongestant that, can take, that contains pseudoephedrine. So if you've had a cold and you recently got some over-the-counter medicine to help with that, what those are, those are alpha agonists, and those can... Uh, increase this urethral sphincter and the prostate tone, making it harder to urinate. Also, if somebody takes chronic pain medication, narcotics, a lot of people know those can cause constipation, but they also can impair bladder contractions, making it harder to urinate. Um, also, reducing the intake of your caffeine, alcohol, acidic drinks, like carbonated drinks and spicy foods, uh, can also help improve urinary symptoms. And if you're getting up a lot throughout the night, trying to cut down on your fluid intake at night can be helpful. Um, if you're taking a diuretic, two common ones are Lasix and hydrochlorothiazide. Taking those in the morning instead of in the evening can be beneficial. If someone just has mild urinary symptoms, um, and they're not that bothered by them, and there's not having any of those complications we mentioned, uh, the the preferred management is to really just do watchful waiting and not do anything, just kind of go over the dietary stuff and just repeat the initial evaluation in one year to see if anything's gotten worse. If your symptoms are bothersome and you have more significant symptoms, then likely medical therapy will be prescribed. I'm going to go through all these uh, medications in a little more detail, but these are the five classes. You can see the alpha blockers, those are commonly used drugs that we start off with first, and you can see Flomax on the list. A lot of people are on Flomax or have heard of that medication. All right, so just to start off with alpha blockers, what they do is they inhibit those receptors, those alpha receptors that can increase in men. They're in the bladder and prostate, uh, the, uh, prostate area that increase tone. They relax that. So they basically relax the prostate. They open up your prostate channel to help you have a stronger flow and empty your bladder. People can actually notice improvement within just a few days of being on these medications, but maximal improvement may take up to one to three months. 
common side effects are dizziness, which usually if you to start taking it regularly, that goes away, nasal congestion, and also retrograde ejaculation. A lot of older guys don't care as much about that, but what that is is when you ejaculate, the semen, instead of shooting out your body, shoots into your bladder. A lot of people ask me, is that harmful? No, you're just going to urinate the semen out over the next couple voids. But a lot of younger men who are sexually active, they're kind of bothered by that. As soon as you stop taking the medicine, that'll reverse. 5-alpha reductase inhibitors is uh, basically it inhibits the enzyme 5-alpha reductase. What that enzyme does is convert testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which is actually the more potent form of testosterone. The, this class of drugs can actually help shrink the size of your prostate. Um, unfortunately, the best it's probably going to do is around 25%. Um, but studies have shown that it can decrease your chance of going into retention, which is where you can't urinate, by up to 50%. The side effects are not very common, um, but the side effects that may occur are erectile dysfunction, which is difficulty getting an erection, um, decreased libido, which is your sex drive, and a decrease in semen volume. But it, you can see those side effects are pretty minimal. A lot of people have heard of Cialis for erectile dysfunction, but actually it has been approved by the FDA to help with BPH. It is the only erectile dysfunction medicine that is approved by the FDA for this. And being on Cialis, you can actually start noticing an improvement in your symptoms within a week, but maximal improvement may take up to two months. The dose for this is five milligrams daily, and common side effects are headache and flushing and myalgia, which is muscle aches. All right, so the, the prostate being so big and the bladder having to work extra hard, the bladder can become overactive. And again, those symptoms are frequency, urgency, and nocturia, which is getting up multiple times at night. The reason for this is twofold. Number one, the bladder becomes overworked. It gets irritated, and those symptoms can happen. Also, if you're not emptying your bladder, then of course your bladder is going to fill up quicker, and it's going to lead to more trips to the restroom. BPH and overactive bladder, they often do occur together, but they don't have to. Some guys that come in do just have overactive bladder and their prostates are normal. These are the six most common overactive bladder medications. These are anticholinergics. What they basically do is they inhibit receptors called muscarinic receptors and they basically relax the bladder to increase bladder capacity and suppress urges so you can uh, go longer before your next void. Uh, common side effects are dry mouth and constipation. Urinary retention is possible because it can over relax your bladder, but this is pretty rare. The other medication that's an overactive bladder medicine is Mirabetric. It's a fairly new drug. It came out in 2012. It's a beta 3 adrenergic agonist, so it does have a different mechanism, but again, it's designed to relax the bladder. Uh, side effects are increased blood pressure, but that's only 10%, and it's only a very mild elevation, if that. Um, headache, and again, urinary retention, which is rare. Uh, a lot of urologists will try you on one medicine. If you're not in improving, you may get on two or three different classes. If you're still not getting better, then some further testing possibly could be done. An easy test to do in the office is a Euroflow PVR, which basically you urinate in a machine. It measures your flow rate, it measures your voiding time, your voided volume, and then your residual, which is how much you're leaving behind after you're done. A cystoscopy may be performed, which is where the urologist takes a scope in the office, deadens your urethra, and runs that into the urethra, prostate, and bladder area to take a look around. A lot of guys are pretty frightened by that test when I talk about it, but it ends up not being a big deal. Um, prostate ultrasounds could be performed. That's an ultrasound probe that goes into your rectum that actually measures the size of your prostate. And urodynamics is not commonly done, but it can be done. It's a little bit more invasive office procedure that actually measures your bladder pressure and your urinary flow rate. A guy that's got a high bladder pressure, that bladder's really working hard, but a slow flow rate, that's a guy that's probably going to do well uh, with a surgical procedure. So surgery for an enlarged prostate, it's appropriate for guys that are having moderate to severe symptoms, and it's recommended for guys that are having complications from their big prostate, such as retention where they can't pee and having to have catheters, um, recurrent infections, uh, refractory blood in the urine that's from the prostate, 
kidney damage or hydronephrosis, bladder stones. If you're not emptying your bladder and your urine's constantly sitting in your bladder, you're prone to forming these stones in your bladder. And also if your urinary symptoms are not improving with medical therapy. These are the three most commonly done surgical procedures. The TERP is basically the rotor rooter A lot of guys come in and they say, oh yeah, my uncle or dad or somebody had that done, or maybe they even had it done in the past. Um, laser th uh, therapies are becoming more common and popular. That's actually my procedure of choice, and most urologists in Baton Rouge like, that I've talked to like to use the laser as well. And I'm going to show a quick little video that kind of helps explain both of those. An open or a robotic prostatectomy for an enlarged prostate is not very commonly done. It's more in the extreme circumstance when a guy just has a huge prostate. All right, so this is not an actual patient. This is just an animated um, uh, little video that shows. A, so this is the, what the urologist is actually seeing. This is a scope going in. The patient would be asleep under anesthesia. The urologist is currently right now in the bladder taking a look around, trying to find those are the little holes that drain the kidneys into the bladder. He wants to identify those to make sure those do not get touched and injured during the case. Um, and then basically there's three lobes of the prostate. The median lobe is the one that right there that kind of protrudes into the bladder. We usually take that down first. And so what the rotor rooter is is this loop. You can see here it basically, and then he burns the, uh, when you get little bleeders you cauterize them and it basically just resects right through that tissue of the prostate. The goal is not to remove all the prostate but just to remove the tissue that's in the way that's obstructing your flow to give you a nice wide open channel there. The tissue flies into the bladder. At the end of the case the urologist will flush all those prostate chips out and then make sure there's no bleeding. Alright, so we don't need to watch all that. So this is the laser procedure. This is the thulium laser. This is an actual patient, a video I saw. I thought it was a good video. The thulium laser is a very popular laser. That's the one I like to use. It's the one most urologists in town like to use. So this is an actual patient. This is what the urethra looks like. This is what the urologist is viewing through the scope on his uh, camera. This is usually done with a nice big TV screen. This is an actual inside of the bladder. Those are those little holes that drain the kidneys that he's looking at. Wants to make sure those don't get injured. He'll do a quick cystoscopy and look around, make sure there's no bladder cancer, make sure there's no stones, make sure everything on the inside of the bladder looks normal before he gets started. Then what he's going to do is he's going to put this laser fiber right through that scope. Um, there it is right there. You can see the big difference of this procedure is that you don't have those chips that you have to remove at the end of the case. Basically that laser just vaporizes that tissue. It just kind of melts away. One thing you'll also notice too is there's uh, very little bleeding with this procedure. So it's a very nice procedure. The blood loss is very minimal and again the goal is to remove a lot of that prostate tissue and give you a nice wide open channel to make it easier for your bladder to, to empty. All right, so I'm going to go down to my second part of my talk, which is prostate cancer. Um, prostate cancer is the most common internal tumor in, in U.S. men. Um, skin cancer may be more common overall, but as far as a, a tumor inside the body, prostate cancer is the most common by far. About 200,000 men in the U.S. a year actually get diagnosed with prostate cancer. One in six men are diagnosed with it in their lifetime, which is about 17%. It is the second uh, most leading cause of cancer death in U.S. men just because it's so common, but only 3% of guys that are diagnosed with prostate cancer end up dying of the disease, uh, so it's very curable. The large majority of guys that come see me in the office with, uh, that are diagnosed with it are totally asymptomatic. They can't believe they have it. Doc, I feel great. What's the deal? Uh, advanced prostate cancer can have some symptoms though. Those are bone pain, but the bones is a common place for the cancer to spread. Uh, urinary symptoms, blood in the urine, uh, retention where you can't pee or hydronephrosis, uh, but that's kind of the more rare situation. So what are the risk factors? Family history, uh, Rudy Macklin was hitting on that hard. Um, 
The risk does increase if you have a first degree relative, which is a brother or your father. Um, if the relative was diagnosed at a younger age and the higher number of relatives you have, those things all increase your risk. African American guys are actually at a 1.6 uh, times higher risk of developing prostate cancer compared to Caucasian men. And the higher the age, the higher the chance, especially if you get 65 and older. So 90% of prostate cancers that are detected by screening are confined to the prostate. So most guys we diagnose with prostate cancer, it's confined, it hasn't spread yet. Prostate cancer screening can reduce your risk of dying of prostate cancer. The negative of prostate cancer is some guy, it, it can lead to overdiagnosis and overtreatment because not all prostate cancers are gonna cause harm or death. So what is prostate cancer screening? It consists of a yearly PSA, which is a blood test, and a yearly prostate exam. And a lot of people ask me, well, what's the, what is a PSA? What is that? So a PSA is basically a protein. It's secreted by the prostate. Women don't have PSAs, so women, I mean, women don't have prostate, so they're not gonna have a PSA. If you draw a PSA on a woman, it's gonna be zero every time. Uh, but PSA is a protein, it basically liquefies semen and that allows sperm to swim more freely. That's the whole goal of PSA. Um, prostate cancer, however, can be present with someone with a normal PSA. So you can have prostate cancer, your PSA can be totally normal, which is why the prostate checks are very important too. So a lot of people that come in to see me, their PSA was high, they say, well, does that mean I have prostate cancer? Well, not necessarily. Prostate cancer can elevate the, the PSA, but there are other things that can do it too. If you have a big prostate, your PSA is gonna be a little bit higher. Prostatitis, which is a prostate infection, can cause the PSA to go up. Having a bladder infection can do it. If you recently ejaculated within a few days of the test, it can actually cause your PSA to bump up a point or two. So a lot of guys that think, yeah, maybe I did ejaculate right before I had that test, I'll have them abstain for about five to seven days and repeat the test. Um, prostate trauma, so if you ride motorcycles or bikes or you just were recently on a long car or plane ride, that can cause a little prostate trauma and cause the PSA to bump up a little bit. All right, so there was a meeting in Australia, the 2013 Prostate Cancer World Congress, and at the end of that meeting, the consensus concluded that men aged 50 to 69, there is level one evidence that demonstrates that PSA testing can reduce your risk of prostate cancer mortality and the incidence of prostate cancer spread. So physicians should discuss the benefits, the risk, and the limitations of prostate cancer screening with patients. The decision to undergo prostate cancer screening is a shared decision between the patient and the physician. So no one's going to hold a gun to your head and make you do it. It's your decision, um, but uh, it should be discussed with your physician. And then ultimately, it's the patient's decision. So a lot of guys will ask me, well, when should I start doing it? Well, that depends on what guideline you look. Some guidelines will say to start at 40, some say 55, but somewhere in that range, you should at least start having a discussion with your physician. Guys that are African-American or have a significant family history probably should get started 40 to 49 range. You know, guys that are, have, uh, don't have any risk factors, no family history, you can consider starting at age 50 to, to 55 but definitely by 55 you should start screening. Um, screening should be offered to guys of the appropriate age who have at least the life expectancy of 10 years. Okay, so on the other end of the spectrum, when people ask me when should I stop doing it, there's actually no universal accepted age of when screening should be stopped. Some guidelines say 70, some say 75. Some guidelines say as long as the man is in excellent health and doesn't have a lot of medical problems, then they should continue screening. And the 2013 Prostate Cancer World Congress said that a man that's in, that's old, a man in good health with at least 10 year life expectancy should not be denied PSA testing based on their age. All right, so what are the indications for a prostate biopsy? A prostate biopsy is what we do to go looking for prostate cancer but there's got to be some guidelines. So what, what will make us recommend a biopsy to a patient? So if a patient has an abnormal rectal exam, if we feel a nodule that feels suspicious, if your PSA is elevated, a lot of times we will repeat it. 
Um, um, but if the PSA is high or if there's a significant change, if it was low one year and it keeps going up, um, that would be an indication to do a biopsy. All right, so the, once you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, you're sitting down, you're talking to a urologist, the urologist will risk stratify you into either a very low risk patient, a low risk, intermediate, or high risk, okay? A very low risk patient is gonna have, have to have all these criteria. The PSA will have to be under 10, the Gleason score, which is grading a prostate cancer. So a Gleason score of six is low grade, seven is intermediate, eight, nine, and 10 is high grade, with 10 being worse than eight. Um, when you have a biopsy, the pathologist will actually specify how much cancer was in that specimen. They'll say maybe 25% of the specimen had cancer. Um, or 75% or 100%. So in order to be very low risk, every biopsy has to be 50% or less. Um, also the standard, most urologists uh, will do 12 biopsies, six on each side. So to be a very low risk patient, you have to have two or less positive cores. And then to move on to staging, you have to be a stage T1C, which basically means your prostate exam is normal. The only reason we did the biopsy is your PSA was high. So a low risk patient is going to have a PSA of less than 10, Gleason score of 6, and a stage of T1 or T2A. T2A is basically you feel a, a very small nodule. An intermediate risk patient is going to be a PSA of 10 to 20 or a, a Gleason score of 7 or a higher stage. A T2B is basically there's a large nodule or the whole maybe left side of your prostate feels abnormal. A T2C means you feel a nodule on both sides. And then a high risk patient is going to have a PSA of over 20, a Gleason score of 8, 9, or 10, or a stage 3. A stage 3 means the prostate cancer feels like it's actually protruding outside the capsule of the prostate. All right, so to move on to prostate cancer treatment, I just, there's, there's a lot of different treatments out there. Some are experimental, um, but these are by far the most common. Active surveillance, which we'll talk about on the next slide, is really not a treatment, it's a form of monitoring. External beam radiation, which is the more traditional kind of radiation. Brachytherapy is the seed implants uh, that some guys have heard about where you get these, it's a surgical procedure, it takes about 30 to 45 minutes, you get these little seed implants and they will slowly emit radiation over a month or two depending on what type of radiation it was. And then a radical prostatectomy which is surgical removal of the prostate. There is actually no universal agreement about which is the best treatment. So everybody asks me, what's the best, what should I do, what's the best treatment? That is, you know, there are some studies that may show prostate cancer, uh, the, the surgery slightly better, other uh, studies that show they're equivalent. In general, there's really no universal agreement on what's the best treatment for localized prostate cancer. For a low risk patient, external beam radiation, brachytherapy, or the surgery, they all appear to have similar cure rates. However, for a high risk patient, brachytherapy by itself, the seeds, uh, appears to have a lower cure rate compared to external beam. You can actually combine external beam with brachytherapy or the surgery. All right, so active surveillance basically is for guys with low risk disease and the point of it is to allow for timely intervention when the disease progresses. The reason to do active surveillance, or some guys choose it, is because the treatments, radiation and surgery, can have some side effects. And so the idea is if you've got low risk disease and you're monitoring it closely, then I'll be treated when my disease gets worse, okay? Um, the NCCN recommends active surveillance in a very low risk patient with a life expectancy of less than 20 years or a lower intermediate risk patient with a life expectancy of less than 10 years. However, if you're a very healthy young guy and you're very motivated, you can be offered active surveillance regardless of your age. Um, let's see. <clears throat> All right, so what is the optimal surveillance protocol? What is actually done? There is, you know, it, it varies depending on which urologist you see and there's really not a set standard for that. But in general, uh, the, the most common form of surveillance is going to be a PSA and a, re and a prostate exam about every three to six months and a repeat prostate biopsy and or prostate MRI about every uh, year to three years. 
triggers that would say, okay, something's getting worse, we need to do something, would be if your PSA keeps rising, if you've got a change in your prostate uh, exam that feels worse than before, or if a repeat biopsy shows higher grade or higher volume cancer. Um, men that are considering doing after surveillance should be counseled on the potential risk of life-threatening progression. Prostate cancer, when it's locally confined, is very curable. Once it's spread, it gets to be much more challenging to treat. And an important thing to discuss with a man who's considering doing active surveillance is the psychological burden of living many years with untreated prostate cancer. All right, so if someone is interested in radiation, I will refer them to a radiation doc. So I'm not going to spend too much time, but I am going to just mention some of the side effects. Um, erectile dysfunction, which is uh, not the inability to get an erection, is very common. Bladder irritation, the bladder and the prostate sit right next to each other, so the radiation can have some scatter effect of the bladder, which can lead to urinary frequency, urgency, and even urgent continence where you have difficulty getting to the bathroom in time and you have a bladder spasm and wet yourself. The rectum also sits right next to the prostate. You can get some rectal uh, irritation, which can lead to diarrhea and bleeding of the rectum. Retention is not very common with external beam, but it's 2 to 15 percent chance with brachytherapy, which means after the procedure, the prostate's going to inflame and swell some, and it may make you have difficulty urinating, and some guys do have to get a catheter put in afterwards. A stricture can form, which is basically scar tissue that can form on the inside of your urethra, uh, which can be a very troubling side effect. And probably the worst side effect that myself and most urologists that have seen before is hemorrhagic cystitis. It can occur actually up to 8% of men. Hemorrhagic cystitis is basically where the bladder becomes very friable, and when you urinate, you can start urinating blood and it's a very difficult problem to treat. Guys have to be admitted, get these big catheters put in, get put on drips. There's not a quick fix for this, and it can occur many years after radiation. All right, so the surgery, the radical prostatectomy, is the removal of the entire prostate and the seminal vesicles. The seminal vesicles are these glands that are attached to the back of the prostate. Prostate cancer can invade into those glands, so we remove those at the same time. It can be done robotically or open. Robotics is now by far the most common way men are getting their prostate removed. Probably 99% or more of guys in the U.S. who are having this procedure are getting it done robotically. A lymph node dissection can be done at the same time. The pelvic lymph nodes, if the cancer is going to spread, is a common place for the cancer to go. And so a lot of times a lymph node dissection will be done at the same time. Uh, the lymph node dissection, however, can be omitted in a low-risk patient. All right, so a lot of people will ask me, is this it? After surgery, I'll never get an erection again? Maybe, uh, but in the appropriate patient, you can do nerve sparing. So the neurovascular bundle, it's basically these tiny nerve fibers. They're mixed in with these blood vessels, and they course on the backside of the prostate. They travel down to your penis to give you a hard-on when, when you want to have sex. So during the surgery, during nerve sparing, you can actually peel these nerves and dissect them away from the prostate. Um, in an appropriately selected patient, cancer control is probably not compromised. However, someone with worse disease, if you do nerve sparing, there is a higher risk of leaving some microscopic cancer behind. The ideal candidate for nerve sparing is someone with low stage, less than 10 PSA, a Gleason score of six, small volume of cancer, and good erections before surgery. You're not going to do an aggressive nerve sparing on someone who already doesn't have intercourse and doesn't get erections. But if you're having good erections before, um, then you want to try to save that if you can. Side effects from the surgery, uh, erectile dysfunction, which I mentioned, uh, stress urinary incontinence. What that is is basically if you cough, sneeze, laugh, lip thumb on something, urine can squirt out. It is common for this to happen after surgery. However, over the next several months or up to a year, that can improve and usually does. But chronic severe incontinence can, uh, occurs in less than 5% of guys. So it's, that's not super common, but it, it but does happen sometimes. An anastomotic stricture, basically when the prostate's removed, the urologist will suture the bladder and urethra back together. Some scar tissue can form in that location. It's not very common, but uh, the textbooks say about 1% to 2%. All right, so... <clears throat> 
I don't get this as much anymore. I think more people are becoming familiar with robotic surgery, but when I first started doing these, I think people would give me this look when I would tell them you're gonna have a robotic prostatectomy that they thought this guy may come in from Star Wars and do the surgery and I would be off playing golf somewhere and then the, the robot would just tell me when he was done and I would just pop back in the room. Um, but that's not actually what happens. I'm gonna show a little video and hopefully that'll clarify things. The advantages of robotics over an open surgery, there's, there's uh, some for the patient, some for the surgeon. For the patient, there's smaller incisions. Patients tend to have less pain after surgery. They tend to go home from the hospital quicker uh, and they tend to recover a little faster and kind of get on with their life. Um, for, and the blood loss tends to be uh, less with robotics. Um, from a surgery standpoint, for the surgeon, the visibility is significantly improved. Uh, you, the surgeon views a nice three-dimensional enhanced view. Um, you know, it's, it, when the surgeon can see better, surgery tends to go better. Um, I'm going to show a quick little video. Um, basically, the robot is a machine that's got four arms on it. It, it. You have these instruments. It attaches to these ports that the doctor puts in. The doctor sits at a console and can view this three-dimensional view. There's a joysticks, in the, and you'll see the urologist, the surgeon, will actually move those joysticks, which will move the arms of the robot. And you put these instruments in and out and attach it to the robot. So it's, it's pretty neat, and I hope this clears it up. The Da Vinci system is an advanced surgical tool that allows doctors to operate minimally invasively through a few small incisions for many procedures. The Da Vinci system has an ergonomic console where the surgeon sits while operating. A nearby side cart is where the patient is placed for surgery. There are four robotic arms. One holds the endoscope, a thin tube with a camera at the end. The second, third, and fourth arms hold the endo-wrist instruments, which are 100% controlled by the surgeon. The surgeon views magnified 3D HD images inside the patient's body and the surgeon's hand movements are translated into smaller, precise movements of the endo-wrist instruments, which bend and rotate far greater than the human wrist. Combined, these features enable da Vinci-trained surgeons to operate with enhanced vision, precision, dexterity, and control. Intuitive Surgical, the maker of the da Vinci system, is the world leader in robotically-assisted surgery. Using the latest in surgical and robotics technologies, da Vinci is taking surgery beyond the limits of the human hand. All right, All right so that concludes my talk. I'm getting pretty excited about football season. Um, anybody have any questions? That's a good question. Uh, other than just stopping the medicine, you know, it, sometimes just increasing your water intake. Sometimes it's a, if you're a little dehydrated and you get some muscle aches. If you're taking a five milligram dose daily, sometimes taking it every other day. Uh, Cialis does have a long half-life and actually, so sometimes you can take every other day. It's not indicated for that. Uh, it's not that's not the standard dose, but I've had guys that have still been able to urinate and have good erections and the muscle cramps were able to go away. Or even cutting the dose in half uh, sometimes can be effective. But if you're still having severe muscle aches, you got to stop it. But it's not very common. I don't get that too much. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, it's very controversial on that. There's, that's a great question, and I, and I get that question a lot. Um, we know when a guy has advanced prostate cancer, so if their prostate cancer has spread, gotten into the bones and lymph nodes, it's more advanced, the treatments are actually these hormone shots that will take your testosterone, whatever it is, three, 400, and the goal is to bring it down to 20. 
and we have seen that that will suppress the cancer. That will actually cause the cancer, some of the cancer dies off, it causes the cancer to go in kind of a hibernation mode. And so for guys, that's the initial treatment when they have advanced prostate cancer is to give them shots that actually suppress your testosterone. So there's concerns, well, on the flip side, if I'm taking testosterone, is that gonna cause prostate cancer? That's never been proven in a research study. I do think that if you're potentially, if you're not being monitored closely and your testosterone is getting too high, you know, if you're, if, Ideally, if a guy's testosterone is like 100, 200, and you get them up to four or 500 and they feel better, I don't think that's gonna cause prostate cancer. If you're running too high, if you're super therapeutic in the thousand range, I think that that potentially can cause some prostate issues and more so BPH than, um, than, prost than prostate cancer. The testosterone? How often are the injections? It really it varies on, you know, the typical is every two weeks. Uh, some guys, I do it every two weeks and I'm monitoring their testosterone and we're just not getting it quite high enough, so I may even go to weekly and then sometimes it's the opposite, where it's, they're too high and we either have to go down on the dose or even space it out. But in general, for most urologists and the way I do it is it's, the injection's about every two weeks. Yes, sir. Right, so that's, that's kind of the rotor-rooter deal, the, the TERP, it's a transurethral resection of the prostate. Um, guys that are not responding to medicines or if they're having some complications from their prostate, that is the gold standard treatment still is, is the TERP. Um, most urologists, myself included, are kind of switching over to the lasers because they're, it's just as effective and it's less blood loss and it's kind of a simple operation, but it's the same principle. You're removing prostate tissue to increase that channel within your prostate to help with your flow. So I do think that that's still a, a very good procedure. For some guys with really big prostates, sometimes the laser, you need a little bit more. It's a little bit faster to do the, the TERP, so sometimes the TERP's still done. Go ahead. Yes, sir. On Flomax? Yeah, have you seen any improvement with your getting up at night on Flomax? Marginal? The, the starting dose is 0.4, and some guys that are still having some issues will even go up to the maximum dose, which is 0.8. Um, but it, you know, other things, you know, if you're taking, if you're drinking a lot of fluids at night, you're gonna get up. Some guys, they get some swelling in their legs, some edema. When you recline at night, that causes fluid shifts and can cause you to get up, cause actually more blood flow to your kidneys and more urine production. So check your legs out. If you're getting a lot of swelling in your legs, sometimes wearing compression stockings during the day or even periodically elevating your legs can help. Uh, but some guys have to get on some of those overactive bladder medicines we talked about, uh, oxybutynin, detrol, Vesicare, those medicines help relax the bladder. So if you're not getting maximum benefit with Flomax, you either need to go up on the dose or you can even combine medications. Uh, some guys, you know, Flomax is a great drug, but it's, it's really more helpful for the flow part of it. But some guys do have an improvement in their overactive bladder symptoms too on Flomax, but not everybody. You had the open surgery? Okay. Must have had a big prostate. <laughs> well, guess what? It's back. How is that possible? The prostate is back, the size. Um, the, the prostate can regrow. It, I, I usually don't see it regrow that fast. You, a lot of guys that have had these procedures five or ten years later, we see some regrowth. That, that would be pretty accelerated at, at only 18 months, but 
A lot of guys that I've done this procedure on, I will keep them on if, they're, if, they're, if they've already been on it or I will start them on a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, which is like Proscar or Avidart, because those drugs can not only shrink the prostate, but they can delay prostate growth. So anybody that's had a real big prostate requiring a procedure, I, as long as they're not having side effects from it, I will keep them on those medicines because I've seen that that can help delay that potential problem that can happen. But I do explain to everybody, if you're having this procedure, you know, some guys' prostate tissue can grow back. And so certainly if you start having symptoms again, you'll, the urologist will have to look in there with a scope to see what's going on and see if that tissue's come back. So some guys, unfortunately, do have to have repeat procedures. All right, any more questions? I, I get blood every three months, and up until about two years ago, I could request a PSA every time they brought they through blood. And two years ago, they stopped doing the PSA. They said they're not reliable or whatever. They wouldn't do the PSA. With the, the insurance wouldn't approve it? No. Okay. And they would test your blood for cholesterol and test your blood. You do a PSA if you ask them. Right. But about two years ago, they stopped offering PSA tests. Right. Um, there was a uh, thing that came out, I think it was in 2011, it was the United States Preventative Task Force that basically said that PSA testing gave it a grade D. Okay. So that got kind of a negative publicity about prostate cancer screening in general. The American Cancer Society, the, the American Urology Association, you know, all of the, the National Cancer Comprehensive Network, all these big major organizations still support prostate cancer screening. This preventative task force was a government task force that was made up of zero urologists and zero oncologists. Um, and the studies that they based that information off were flawed. And so PSA testing has been, since it's been in existence, since the early 90s, there's been a significant trend of decreased death in prostate cancer and with catching prostate cancer early. Certainly PSA testing, if you're getting screened, potentially can lead to overdiagnosis, uh, like I talked about earlier. And so there is a pendulum and it's, you know, that's why it's a, de it's a decision between the patient and the uh, physician as far as do you want to do screening, and if you do, when do you want to start, when do you want to finish, how often do you want to do it. Some guys just want to do it every two years. Most guys do still want to do it yearly. Certainly if you have a family history, you should be doing it. So really, you know, it's, it's still recommended by many organizations. Um, I have still never had an insurance company refuse to pay for it. I've never had a patient come back and say, I had to pay for this out of pocket, the insurance. So insurances are still covering it. I mean, I don't know why they, that particular uh, blood drive cut you off, but that's kind of the deal on prostate cancer screening. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. I would like to know, uh, is there any type of preventive measures far as supplements or certain type of foods that we need to uh, concentrate on more than, um, you know, other women or other individuals. Since we know that as men get older and, um, you know, we have this particular problem with our PSA, um, what is it that we need to concentrate more on? And, um, is there a certain type of supplement or vitamin that we can help that, you know, besides just taking, you know, the test every year. Right. That, that's an awesome question. There, there is not anything definitively out there that says if you do this, you are going to have a less chance of prostate cancer. A low-fat diet has been studied and maybe shown some marginal improvement. Um, vitamin E has been studied and has been shown to be ineffective. Pomegranate, there's some studies on that that have showed possible green teas, some possible benefits, but these benefits are marginal, and a lot of studies either show no benefit or maybe just some marginal benefit. The, the best thing you can do if you're concerned about prostate cancer is just to see either your primary care physician or urologist and talk about it, discuss it, you know, and then based on your risk factors and your age 
and then kind of how aggressive you want to pursue it. Like I said, some guys that are younger, they come in in their 40s, they say, okay, you know, I, I want to maybe do it this year, and then if everything's normal, I'll come back in a couple years and do it again. And then once you get older in their 60s, I'll start doing it yearly. So it's really, there's multiple different guidelines and um, on when to start screening and when to stop. And it's really, I have some guys that are 80, very healthy, they drive, and they want to keep doing it. And I'm not going to cut them off because of that. Um, if they're 80 but they have a lot of medical problems and you know physicians don't know everything but if I say the chances of this guy being around in 10 years are very low then me diagnosing him with prostate cancer is not going to be beneficial so that would be somebody I would steer in the direction of not doing it. But to answer your question there's really not a specific vitamin or supplement that is you know this is definitely the thing to do uh, but Green tea, pomegranate, even tomatoes, uh, I've read, potentially can be helpful, but low-fat diet, those are probably the only things out there that have said, yeah, there may be some benefit there. All right, anybody else? Okay. A lot of times, you know, they're getting up at night to urinate, I would say for a, a male 50 and older with a big prostate, a lot of times it is. We a lot of times blame it on the prostate and it's not. It, it, you know, that's a tough question to answer for, for you in particular, but it, you know, if you had an exam and your prostate was big and you had some other urinary symptoms, then definitely and we'd put you on some medicine and if you had a good response with the typical prostate medicines, then yes. But, you know, there's issues as far as drinking fluids at night and, and having edema or swelling of your legs at night. Um, some people just aren't very good sleepers, so they may be waking up for other reasons and then you're already awake, so I might as well go to the bathroom. So there is a lot of factors besides just, and some guys just have kind of a low capacity overactive bladder. So there is multiple reasons for that, but the prostate is, is one of the more common reasons for getting up at night. All right, anybody else? All right, thank you.